It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Just moments after the Flames took a 4-1 victory over the Buffalo Sabres, we're here for another Fireside Chat. And it's been a slow week for the Flames, but Matt and I are still here. There's lots that we're going to talk about tonight. How you doing, buddy? Good. A nice win over the Sabres. Good to beat the team that they should beat. You know, I was surprised that it was 1-1 for as long as it was in that game. The Flames weren't looking a whole lot better than the Sabres there. And really in the third period, they exploded. But I was expecting them to get off to a, a big lead early on. Well, with the time off, they needed some time to adjust and get their legs back under them. And you have to credit the Sabres. They made sure to get sticks in their bodies in front of shots to limit the Flames' opportunities in the first two periods. Yeah, I was wondering when I was watching the first period in a bit if the Flames were maybe caught a little bit off guard by how the Sabres were playing. But that team that we saw tonight does not look like a team that lost 11 in a row. Well, at least we made it 12. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Well, talking about the time off, uh, there's only been two games since you and I talked last. Uh, the last time we chatted was at the end of the Yoni Ordeo road swing, and we were one day away from the Flames playing the Ducks in the Honda Center. And unfortunately, the curse continues. The Flames ended up losing 6-3 to the Ducks in that game. Yeah. What are your thoughts of that contest? If Backland doesn't miss the wide-open net, the Flames probably would have found a way to come back, but whatever that building has over Calgary, I don't know. It seems like every time we go there, some stupid, weird, random thing happens, and that costs us the game. Last time, it was our player kicking the puck into our net and getting a goal called off for kicking it in their net that was the difference and this time it was missing a wide open net yeah it's it's so weird that we just it's one building that we can't get a win in no and it's only the one win in 16 years like it's not like it's the same players that just keep losing there I was surprised in that game to see former flame Tim Jackman score a goal that's not a guy you're expecting to be an offensive contributor yeah, you know you're cursed when. <laughs> Pretty much. Even Ben Lovejoy got his first goal in that game. Uh, but yeah, I thought, you know, the Flames played about how I expected them to there. And um, some of the guys looked like they were ready for the time off. Some of them just looked like they were, by the end, just deflated. Yeah, it happens. And it was a successful road trip. They got four out of the five wins. Anytime you get four wins on a road trip, it's all good. For sure. Um, And then we had the All-Star break. After that, we had the Flames had quite a a stretch. I think they had, what, five, one, two, three, four, five, five days off. The All-Star break was in there. Um, Some interesting turns of events there. Johnny Goudreau was originally going to the All-Star game just to be part of the skills competition, but due to injury, ended up making it uh, into the game and playing in the game. I know you didn't watch the game, I didn't watch the game, but I've watched some of the highlights since, and I mean, with the score the way it was in that game, the highest scoring All-Star game ever, you know that this game needs some sort of a change to it. Yeah, actually I did manage to find some time to watch the All-Star game, and it was the lousiest game I've ever seen. (laughs) It was what, 17 to 19? 17, 12. 17, 12. And, you know, I mean, I, I watched about the f- I watched the first period of it, maybe, but I had other things I was doing. I think I watched the whole first period. And, um, yeah, it just, you can tell it's these guys sort of phoning it in. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't look like uh, what we would expect no. from NHL players. No, and in the past, when the formats have been different, instead of, like, having the draft, per se, uh teams have actually had some pride like back when it was the north american players versus world or the east versus the west like the games actually mattered to the players but uh, this it was just shinny for 
30, 30 periods and who cares? Well, let's talk about that. So last night, you and I were on Agree or Disagree, the podcast, and you can find more about them the easiest way is on Twitter. They're at A or D, the podcast. And we were talking about kind of the Flames season so far. And we mentioned that uh, we both, I think, f- believe that the NHL needs to revamp the All-Star game. The format needs to change. To me, this whole thing that we have now about, you know, have two captains and have them pick guys like we're playing shinny hockey on the lake is just stupid. Yeah, it's not really that interesting to watch as an event. And who really cares? Like, just have a... <sighs> The team should be set, and you go to it. Uh, I don't know. Just, just seems kind of a waste of time. So, Matt, if you were, if Gary Bettman called you up and said that he wanted your help to change the All Star Game, what format would you change it to? I would actually go with the defending Stanley Cup champions versus the NHL All Stars, the original way it was done. And that's it, the. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that's the original style that they used to use. Yeah, and like I know with players being traded and all that, you would just have wherever, like, say a player from Bo- L.A. got traded to Boston for that one night, he would become a king again to face the All Stars of the league. Yeah, I mean the All Stars come together from thirty teams. There's no point. There's no reason that the four or five guys that left can't come back for one night. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think I, that would be a lot more compelling than whatever that was on the weekend. Yeah, I agree. I was going back and looking. I mean, there's the format you mentioned where the defending champions take on the all-star team, which I think would be quite compelling too. Um, I also saw, as we all know, there was the West versus East and the various iterations of that over the years, which I think is a good way to do it, but even there, there's no real pride in so the West wins or the East wins. I don't think anybody cares. Um, The North America versus the World thing was always one that sort of intrigued me. I like the idea of the North America versus the World, but now we're going to start seeing that again with the World Cup, so I'm not sure I'd go back to that. Yeah, it's kind of tough having something that actually matters in some way. One format that I mentioned last night on Agree or Disagree, the podcast, and we were talking about it, was uh, I would like to see them try a Young Stars versus All Stars game. Maybe they take all the best players under the age of 23 and put them up against all the guys older than 23 and see which team wins. Yeah, that'd be interesting. The new blood versus the old. And we're seeing that in the new World Cup format, that there's going to be a team made up of players that are under the age of 23 that will go up against the international squads. And that could kind of be a teaser for that new format to get people excited about it if they did it right. So, yeah, I, I'd like to see that. I just I think, to me, there needs to be more importance on the All-Star game somehow. It just seems like kind of a throwaway game. I know in Major League Baseball, the winner of the All-Star game gets home field advantage in the World Series, right? Yeah, and ever since then, the players seem to have taken it more seriously in baseball as well. So maybe we could do something like that in hockey. I don't know what we do. Um, the Stanley Cup format as it is is pretty set, but maybe there's some way we could make the the All-Star game mean something later on or down the road or at the draft or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I'd have to think about it, but I, just, I think the current format is silly and I think the current format is broken and I'd either like to go with the Young Stars uh, versus All-Stars. I'd go with the format you pitched, which was the defending champions against the league's All-Stars. Or I'd even say let's go back to North America and the world, but I just think we need to change what we've got yeah, right now. I know. The current format is bordering on almost being unprofessional and unbecoming of a league like the NHL. I think unprofessional is a good word there. Yeah, it just, it seems like a bunch of kids. I mean, we used to do that when we were playing on the pond as kids. It's, you know, grab the guys around you and then you, you know, one at a time, pick the guy you want. It just seems like a pickup game. And I think that probably sets the attitude for the weekend too. Yeah. And congrats to Johnny Gaudreau for picking up $200,000 as a bonus for going to the All-Star game. That's a nice bonus. He didn't win a car, but, you know. Well, there's only one car to be given out unless you're Ovechkin. He got a second car donated to him. Mm. 
What would you think if they were to eliminate the All-Star game altogether and just have the skills competition? I wouldn't mind that if they had like more of an expanded skills competition, like say like you name an all-star team and have them go up against guys that are just dedicated, skilled in that one area. Yeah. Or I don't know. I'm even, and I'm just thinking, I haven't really thought this through. I'm thinking out loud here, but what if you were to name, yeah, the best guys in each category. So instead of having a team necessarily, you are saying, yeah, these are our best skaters and these are our best shooters. And, and then you just play them off. And what if there was almost a playoff until we get down to, you know, one guy and it could almost take two week, two days of the weekend to do like a general round robin the first day. And then the, you know, next four guys that are left go against each other the second day. Yeah, like a mini Olympics or something. And maybe there's even a cash bonus. Maybe it's, hey, the winner of every you know event gets an extra million dollars. Yeah, or a, a donation to their charity of choice or something. Yeah, so there's some sort of incentive to go out there and actually win it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have to do something. It's kind of stale at the moment, and they should be taking surveys from fans like us and others to try and get different ideas and try to figure out something that'll make it better. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll see some change soon. Uh, Gary Bettman's in Calgary this week to talk to fans, so maybe people will ask him about that. But I think that they tend to switch their format every three to five years, it seems, lately. So maybe we'll see some again very soon. Yep. And if anyone has any ideas, tweet us, go on Facebook, talk to us, let us know what you think of our ideas or if you have any other ideas for the All-Star game. But let's move back to the Flames for a bit. Um, No surprise, I don't think, to any of us. The Flames sent down a whole bunch of players before... Uh, the week-long break to the AHL. Namely, in there was uh, Watherspoon again, Granlin, and Ordeo. Ordeo hasn't been brought back up, but the Flames did make three recalls uh, just yesterday before the homestand that they're on right now, and they brought Sven Berchi, Tyler Watherspoon back up, and surprisingly to me, they also brought up David Wolf. Uh, what do you think of those three recalls? Uh, well deserved on David Wolf's part. He has really stepped up his game as he has adapted to the North American style game. He has seven goals in his last six games, and he has been quite dangerous out there. He's got 21 points so far, 12 goals, 9 assists, 21 points, 68 penalty minutes. And he's he's a big boy, 6'2", 216. So um, I know when you and I saw him at at the rookie camp in the summer, he just he looks menacing. Yeah, he's. I know some fans are might expect him to be more of a Brandon Bullig type uh, or a Brian McGratton type, but he actually plays more like a Milan Lucic, and he can injure you in more ways than one. <laughs> He's 25, and it, you could tell it took him some time at the beginning of the year when we were watching the AHL games to become accustomed to the North American style. Yeah, he was almost caught off guard at like how quick the game was and like how he could throw hits instead of how it's how it is over in Germany. So he's adapted to that, and he's using his body more effectively to both generate offense and to keep the puck in the zone and cycle it better. Yeah. And he has, you're right over the past, I'd say maybe 10 games. Um, he's really started to look a lot more like a guy who's comfortable in the North American game and at the AHL level. Yeah. And I'm glad that management has continued with their earned, not given mantra because Wolf has earned it, even though, if you look at the Adirondack roster, there's a whole bunch of other players that could have gotten a recall in his place. Yeah, but, you know, I think, and we've seen this a lot, I mean, even Corbin Knight got called up and guys that were here for a short time, I think they want to see what they've gotten. Wolf. He's only on a one-year deal, so there's probably a lot of, do we want to bring this kid back? What kind of potential does he have? I don't think he's going to play a lot of minutes. I think he'll probably be a fourth-line guy. Um, but probably a good recall at this point, just see what they got there. Yeah, and if he can be a disturber out there and 
basically be a Lance Bulma type. <laughs> it can't hurt. Well, that was the first thing I actually thought when I saw that they recalled Wolf. I wondered if Lance Bulma was uh, hurt or something because they they seem like they would almost fill the same roster spot. And it's nice to see that both Sven Berchi and Tyler Watherspoon got the recall. I don't know as if uh, after the performance tonight whether or not there will be enough roster spots open that they'll be able to draw in against Minnesota, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think, you know, we saw Sven earlier this season with the Flames. Arguably didn't have the best showing so far this year. He's got uh, three assists, and that's it. Um but I think, as we've talked about before, Sven still has to has a role with this team and has to show what his worth is here. And I still think that he's got some value. I don't think the Flames should be looking to move him or trade him. I think he's got some value. He might be a bit of a slow starter, but I, I think he'll be around for a while. And I think bringing him yeah, back up just gives him another shot at this level and seeing if he can play here. Yeah, and when he went back to Adirondack... This last time, uh, he changed how he played and has been playing more like he was when we first recalled him from Portland. So hopefully if he gets an opportunity to draw in that he'll be able to contribute more positively than playing a depth role on the fourth line. Yeah, and and I mean, he's not a fourth-line guy, but I think last time he kind of forced the Flames' hand to put him there because he wasn't looking like some of the guys who are further up in the depth chart, and I think that's where Sven has kind of been caught between a rock and a hard place so far, and I hope he can break that. Definitely, and he needs to figure out how to be successful at the NHL level, and hopefully the coaching staff can give him enough of an opportunity where he'll either sink or swim on his own accord. And do you think the number 26, Tyler Watherspoon, is going to be drawing into the lineup in this homestand? I thought Derek England had a bit of a weak game against the Sabres. He turned the puck over a couple of times in really inopportune spots, so I could see him drawing in for England. Yeah, you know, we, we've seen guys um, like Diaz, who's kind of the seventh defenseman, not playing all that well when he's been out there. England hasn't been playing well. I think that Tyler Watherspoon could definitely draw in for either one of those guys. Diaz had a good game tonight, uh, I thought. Probably but, his best as a flame. Yeah, for sure. And I think you're right. If anyone's going to come out of the lineup for a game or two, it'd probably be England at this point. And I don't think it could hurt to take England out of the lineup. He's not giving us enough where we need him there. I think you could easily swap him for Watherspoon. My only worry at that point would be, is Watherspoon going to get enough minutes? Because they're never playing that uh, England pairing more than it seems five or six minutes a night. Well, it would be better than sitting on the in the press box eating popcorn. But would it be better than staying in Adirondack? Well, unfortunately, Corey Potter can only be up for six more days before he has to be sent through waivers again. So that's why Watherspoon was selected instead. Yeah, it just seems like kind of a weird move because it doesn't seem like we need a defenseman. Um, It just seems like they're bringing him up just to see what they've got there. But when I'm looking at the roster, I mean, it's not like England is hurt or needs to be taken out. We've got Smead hurt, but we've got Diaz to slot in for him. Maybe they just like having the seventh guy there just because, I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. They might just like to carry seven defensemen with them. I could see if they're going on a road trip, but being in a homestand, it doesn't, I don't know, it just seems kind of weird to me when they're at home to be carrying the extra defensemen. But we'll see what happens. I mean, they've got uh, Minnesota where I might not draw them in. I might give them more time against uh, Edmonton. That might be where we see Watherspoon and uh, Berchi get some time, or even against the Jets. Yeah, and with the Flames playing five more games in the next week and a half, uh, I would expect that the, all of those guys will get at least a game in somewhere. And you know, you're right. That could be it too. The Flames have a lot of hockey against a lot of good teams coming up, and these guys might just be here as an insurance thing. If we know guys are going to get banged up, 
Uh, we've got a tough February schedule coming and especially the first part of February. And I think we will be really lucky if we make it out of February without a serious injury. Uh -huh. So maybe these guys are just here so that they're already here and know the system when we need them. Only Hartley will know. Let's look at that February schedule. So if we take a look at uh, starting in early February, we have a three-game homestand. We have the Winnipeg Jets coming to town. Then we have the San Jose Sharks and the Pittsburgh Penguins. The next week, we go on the road for two games. We go down to San Jose and L.A. Then we're back here to play Vancouver, Boston, Minnesota, and the Ducks again. And then we go on the road again, uh, do the New, uh, New York, New Jersey back-to-back, -back, and we play the Islanders. It's a tough schedule coming up. Yeah, it'll be a good learning experience for all these young forwards on what it's like to go through a month of hell. <laughs> Yeah, it will be. And I think it's it's really going to show these guys if they've got what it takes or not. You know, these are all pretty much all playoff teams that we're playing against and all really good teams. I mean, the Ducks, the Penguins, uh, the Kings, the Bruins, I think, are some of the top teams in the NHL. And that's really where you're going to see if you've got what it takes. Yeah, and if this team is destined to make the playoffs, they need to find a way to win a good portion of those games. And, and I think that's going to be the hard part here is I don't know, looking at the schedule, how many they're going to win. The nice thing is they don't they only have one back-to-back -back in there. And otherwise, they always have at least one night off between games, which is helpful to help heal things. But I think we're going to be lucky to make it out of February at uh, 500. Yeah, that to me would be a successful month. And anything better than that is just gravy. And really, I think February can make or break the playoff hopes for this team. Yes, and thankfully, if the Flames do get through the month relatively unscathed, then in March and April, uh, the schedule gets significantly easier with a lot more games against middle of the road or teams like Edmonton. So... If the Flames are still in a playoff spot at the end of February, I like their chances to actually make the playoffs. We play LA, what, twice? Once that month uh, in February. And LA is nipping at our heels for the second wildcard spot. So I think that, you know, winning against LA and winning against Minnesota are going to be important because those guys are behind us. Um, I don't think Minnesota is going to catch us, but I think that we need a win to kind of keep them at bay there. So there's yeah, some of those. Even, like, even the two games against the sharks, those, cause the sharks are just immediately ahead of us. That's true. They're only one point up on us. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. The Sharks will be must wins. The San Jose games will be the San Jose Sharks games will be must wins. Uh, the L.A. Kings games will be must wins. I think that the Minnesota game is going to be a must win. We got one next week or one this week and one um, late in February. And obviously the uh, interdivision games are going to be must win too. But as much as you don't as much as you don't want to kind of think of it that way, we could probably afford to lose the Eastern Conference games. We could probably afford to lose the Penguins, the Bruins, not all three of the New York swing, but I think we could probably lose one of the New York swing and still be okay as long as we're at least 500 against the Western teams. True. And the Flames just need to find a way to win, period. And That's their MO. And if they can manage, we'll be having hockey after April 12th. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'm hoping that that happens. It's been a long time coming. Five years now, so... Yeah, it, wow. That is a long time. I stopped counting after a while. Yeah, at least we're not Edmonton, you know. I think it's, what, nine, eight years now? Something like that? I don't know. I stopped counting on them a long time ago, too. <laughs> yeah, it's eight now for okay. Edmonton. Yeah, I'm looking ahead, like you said, in March. Um, March, we we have a bit of a road swing at the beginning. But, yeah, easier games there for sure. Um, still some hard ones. We got the Flyers a couple times. We got the Blues. Uh, we have the Ducks coming to town. But we've got oh, yeah. Colorado, um, you know, Nash Nashville, Dallas, 
some games that are probably going to be easy. Well, I guess the Nashville game probably won't be easier, but we got Dallas a couple times. Um, we got Colorado in there. So, yeah, probably not as demanding that schedule. Yeah, it, there's good teams in there, but it's not like every game's a good team. <laughs> so it makes it a little easier. Yeah, it does. And then we have only five games in April. We're at, what, 48 games played so far? So yeah. over the halfway point. But, yeah, I think that uh, February is going to be make or break for the Flames and their playoff chances this year. I think that if we can't, if we don't get out at 500 on the whole month, uh, we're really in danger. And I think at that point, the Flames' fate isn't going to be in their own hands. I think we'll have to leave it in everyone else's hands as if we're in or out. Yes. But, you know, even if we don't make it, Matt, I mean, we weren't coming into the season expecting a playoff spot. So do you think that there's any point right now if we look at the season where we could look at this season and say this season was not productive, this season was a failure? To me, oh, no. no matter what what happens, I think we have to say that this was a really successful season for this team. Exactly. And the thing is, is that regardless of how the the next two months pan out, there will be positives that will be taken from it. If the Flames fizzle out and miss the playoffs, it's a good learning opportunity for the young players like Monaghan, Gaudreau, and all that to see, okay, you played at this level and it didn't work. So you have to learn to elevate your game to this level and just to get into the playoffs... And then you got to learn how to actually win once you get there. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, honestly, I think that, yeah, even if those guys don't make the playoffs, you're right. It could be good to have the summer to work with these guys a little bit more. And, you know, it, not that going to the playoffs is a bad thing at all. I mean, of course it's not. But, yeah, you're right. I think it could be a little bit more motivation. If you work with them on that motivation, look how close we got. We just need to, you know, up our game a little bit. I think that could really be a, a great motivation for next year. And for fans, it gives us something to look forward to there, too. Even if we don't make it, we can always say, you know, look how close we are. We can do this, obviously, you know, in the next couple of years. Yeah, the thing I'm concerned about, if the Flames do make the playoffs, how will the fan base react? Because I'm concerned the Flames realistically are still in a rebuild, even if they do make the playoffs. And I hope that the flames don't follow Colorado's track of bringing in a couple of veteran guys to like push them over the top. And it, when they're not ready for that and it derails their team a bit. You're right. That, that could be a real worry, especially with the, uh, tr with the trade deadline on March 2nd is if we are in a playoff spot, you might see the flames feel like their hand is forced a little bit to make a move to bring in maybe a rental player or a high priced veteran that really is not in the best interest long term. Yeah, well even on like free agency day or towards the draft, like I wouldn't want Calgary to go out and acquire like Colorado's version of Jerome McGinley just because oh we're a playoff team now when it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Well, I brought that up to you earlier this year too, not only with the team, but I think also with the fan expectations of, I know, you know, if you look back at Oh four, that was a fluky run. We were not, I think you could ask anyone. We were not built as a playoff team that year. We we're not built as a Stanley cup team that year, but somehow we managed to get there. And I think that really because of that, the Flames, after that, kept building that team wanting a repeat success and made mistakes because of it. So I wouldn't want to see that again of the fans now expecting, okay, we made it once, we're a playoff team, so the Flames have to go out and do what you're saying of, you know, go out and make those same kind of moves, go out and do what Colorado's done, and really derail this whole rebuild. And if that's what's, what we think is going to happen, I'd rather bow out of the playoffs and stay the course. Yeah, and... It's one of those things that if you're patient, it, like this team is showing enough, both at the NHL level and the AHL level, that there's a lot of positives there. So just because you're getting some early success doesn't mean that you have to put future success uh, in question because of 
oh, well, we should be a playoff team from now on. To me, too, you have to prove it more than once. I mean, we always see teams get lucky. There's always a Cinderella team. There's always a team that does better and plays above where they should be. And we've done that, but we didn't do that last year. I mean, last year we were right near the bottom. This year is a, a fluke, and there hasn't been a whole lot of change to really warrant that on the roster. So to me, I would say before I'd want to see the Flames going out making those kind of wholesale changes in the offseason, show we can do this twice in a row. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and plus we don't know exactly what a whole host of our players are. And like Chris Russell has stepped up his game and has really emerged as a good number three. And then you have player rookies like Josh Juris and a bunch of other guys that kind of came out of nowhere. And like, are they that caliber of player, or is it just a? fluky hot season like Derek Smith had a few years ago. Exactly. And I mean, even, and I always bring people back to this, but uh, you might remember when David Moss first came up as a, as a flames call up, he was, I think he got like, you know, eight goals in 10 games or something like that. And he was looking like the next hot thing. And we all know what's happened to his career. He's just kind of leveled out as a bottom six forward. And for years didn't really play much for the flames because he was hurt. So, yeah, I think for sure we have to give these guys more than one season, all these kids, to really see what we've got there. I mean, even a guy like Granlin, who I think we've seen some great play from, has been bouncing up and down between the NHL and the AHL. So I think we really need to decide next year what we've got, see what's there, wait for a guy like uh, Sam Bennett to get back in the roster, and then see if we can do this twice in a row. And from there, make some decisions if we want to keep the rebuild going or if we want to move forward. Yeah, and with the Flames having the meritocracy, if you're doing well, you'll play. Keep that going. And the Flames have about 15 to 20 good forward prospects. Cycle them through. And if guys are playing well, let them play. If they're struggling like Granlund was towards the end of his most recent Flames experience... Send them back down to Adirondack for a while and just keep moving people through and the best ones like Juris will rise to the top. Now, you were saying earlier, too, how you don't want them to go out and make, you know, uh, a move like Colorado did for Jerome McGinley in the offseason. I agree with you, but I do think that there is some some. um I do think there are some moves that can be made in the off season for the flames to get better by bringing UFAs and especially on the blue line. Do you think after a season like this, it's going to be easier for us to attract UFAs? Oh, definitely. If you're a hardworking player and especially if you're a defenseman, you look at how Calgary activates their defense core and you're looking at how, how many points guys like Weidman, Russell Brody and Giordano are putting up. Well, if you're a good offensive two-way defenseman and you're a free agent, you look at Calgary, that's like the perfect place to go because you're gonna, your skills are going to be used right. And that'll mean more for your next contract. Like if you come in and say you're signing a $5 million contract and then you put up 40 points, well, your next contract, you can get six, seven, eight million dollars $8 once that deal is over so you know it would definitely be a, a good motivator for somebody to come here for yeah and i think that with the flames not being a, a bottom dweller like we were last year i think there's very little motivation last year but i think you know you might say especially if you're a guy who's maybe been a, you know 28 29 years old who's maybe been a 3-4 or even a 4-5 player somewhere else you might say you know what I'm going to show people that I can play better than that and I can be further up a lineup I, I look at a guy like you mentioned earlier Chris Russell I think did that he was not seen as a 3-4 guy before we got him and he's really worked his way up to be in that role here in Calgary. So I think there's a lot of room there. As, as we've seen, if you play well, you'll play more. And if you're a guy that's motivated and want to play, yeah, I think this would be a great place to come in the offseason. Yeah, and with Calgary giving opportunities to players, like we've seen two veteran guys already lose their spot 
on the forward ranks this year in Setaguchi and McGratton. So if you're a prospect and you're playing well enough, the veteran will go away. <laughs> so, you know, if you have that competition amongst the defensemen, that would also help because you're going to be getting the best results, period, even if it's not necessarily from one guy or another. Yeah, for sure. And I think one benefit the Flames have there, too, is the ability. I don't want them necessarily to go out and grossly overpay, but I think that because we have so much cap room, we can outbid other teams for top defensemen. Yeah, I think that the only area that I would like the Flames to specifically target in the UFA market would be getting a good number three. And is there anyone specifically that you know is going to be UFA that you see as that number three? Uh, not off the top of my head. I know Mark Stahl was uh, set to be UFA, but he resigned with the Rangers. That was kind of the guy I was thinking of. But with the cap going down, maybe you can get pick off a guy like Brent Seabrook off the Blackhawks or somebody like there's going to be someone available somewhere. So is Mike, Mike Green is a UFA this year. Yeah, but we already got uh, Dennis Weidman and I don't know if you want too many all offense guys on your lineup. No, but to me, I'd rather have Green than Weidman and I would move Weidman if I could get Green. True. I don't know. You know uh, I don't know. I mean, there, there's a lot of older guys. I'm looking at the list here. Guys like Erhoff, um, Mazaros, Vishnovsky, Paul Martin, Gonchar. A lot of older guys, and I want them to stay away from those guys. Eric Brewer, Sheldon Sore, Kimo Timonen. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be that finding the younger player. And the Flames have also done well of taking guys who are, you know, guys like Chris Russell, who were probably a five, six, or even seven guy on other teams and giving them a spot. So there's probably names I'm just glossing over here because I'm not even familiar with the guy. But maybe even somebody like Adam McQuaid might be able to come in here and, and really excel. Yeah, and the thing is, is that with the Flames having such a large amount of forward depth, that you could trade off either a young player prospect or even a veteran for a good number three defenseman and not really impact your team that much. That's true. So, yeah, we, we might not even have to wait till the offseason to do that. We could do that before March 2nd. Yeah, so it really just depends on... Who, what, and where. <laughs> so. Well, I think we both agree that's probably the biggest thing that we need to deal with as a as a team right now is the defensive depth. And, yeah, there's definitely a lot of different moves they can make there. Um, you also went out and did some research this week and started looking at some potential UFAs um, that we could bring in, not necessarily former NHL players, but UFAs from other leagues and other teams um, in, uh, that we might bring in. And um, those were some interesting names. Some of them I've heard of, some of them I haven't. But why don't we go through some of these guys that you're thinking the Flames might bring in. Um, the first guy on the list that you gave us was a, or still is a KHL player, 23-year-old defenseman Nikita Zaitis, Zaitsev? Zaitsev. Uh, Zaitsev? He's a good two-way defenseman, kind of in the same style as Brody and Russell. Uh, he's one of the top scorers in the KHL. And with the Ruble being, you know, not so good, and the league itself being in question, you might see some of these younger KHL stars actually transition to the NHL, sort of like Roman Trevenka did. And while he didn't really pan out for the Flames, perhaps a guy like Zaitsev, who is a really good offensive defenseman, he might be able to come in and step in and take a role in the NHL. Additionally, there are... A few guys from the NCAA. Uh, here, let me check the names. But you know, one of the one of the problems I have with with Zaitsev is he's so small. I mean, six one. He's one hundred eighty seven pounds. To me, I think he's got to add some bulk before he would be a legitimate NHL defenseman. Well, the NHL seems to be kind of in a transition itself on defense, where 
size isn't everything. And, like, we're seeing guys like Chris Russell, who's undersized, Tori Krug, and a few others that they're not necessarily big, but if you're skilled enough, you can play. And, like, Anton Strahlman, he's 6'1", but I think he's only, like, 160 pounds as well. So, you know, it just depends on the player and if they're able to cope with it. And how would you say, like, if you're... It, there's a difference between contending and making the playoffs. And ideally, you wouldn't want to have a defense core that's, like, all six feet, six feet one, or 5'11", if you're going to be a contender. But, you know, we're not at that point yet, and... Well, and as we've seen even with Johnny Goudreau, you can have one or two of those guys, you know, Johnny Goudreau, Paul Byron, you can have one or two of those smaller guys and still be competitive. Yeah, and you would like to acquire some guys that are 6'3", 6'5", 6'8", but uh, you're more likely going to have to draft those types of guys, not because they don't usually even come up through trade too often either. Well, and usually even if they're not the best player, they get drafted by somebody just because they're figuring they can make something of a big guy. Mm-hmm. You don't see too many of those guys signed as uh, UFAs. Yeah. Well, the next guy on your list was, uh, or I guess is, a player who plays in the NCAA. We're going back to kind of the Jay Feaster thing here, so in the uh, college players. He plays for Western Michigan University, 6'2", 205-pound defenseman Kenny Morrison. This is a guy I've never even heard of before he brought his name up. Um, What do you think of Morrison? Uh, He's got a really dynamite slap shot. He's a right-handed shooting defenseman. He's... More of a two-way guy, not necessarily going to be a stalwart offensive guy, but he is one of the top uh, UFA defensemen. So it's one of those things. Like it, with the next couple of guys on the list, if you can add to the, the Adirondack slash Stockton's defense core, Perhaps one of those guys becomes the defense equivalent of Josh Juris, where he comes out of nowhere after a while and becomes your good number three, number four defenseman. And with guys like Morrison, he's a good right-handed shooting defenseman, which the Flames lack. Hopefully, between him... Uh, the next guy on the list, Casey Nelson and Zach Palmquist, all of them are more two-way defensemen. They can bring a little offense. They can play defense. None of them are, like, legit, sure things, but if you keep throwing darts at the board, hopefully one of them will hit. <laughs> well, to be fair, there's very few legit, sure things that are Un- unrestricted free agents. I mean, if they were a legit sure, sure thing, they would have been drafted. Yeah, and even then, uh, they're not necessarily a legit sure thing. <laughs> but I mean, remember too that if you look at the Flames' history of bringing in players who are undrafted, Josh Juris is one you mentioned. On the defensive side, we brought in our captain, Mark Giordano, as an undrafted free agent. So there is some precedent there that, you know, even though they don't necessarily look great right away, they can turn into quite good defensemen. Yeah, and with the Flames' meritocracy in place, uh, we would be an attractive place to play because if a guy like Kenny uh, Morrison, Casey Nelson, or any of these other guys come in and they play well, they know that they will get a shot somewhere. And if they outplay a veteran, they will get the spot. And that's something that the Flames had a huge problem with in years past where... Like, you could set the league on fire and you're going to be playing on the fourth line because all these veteran guys are here and too bad for you. Yeah. And and if you look at the Flames depth chart, too, it couldn't hurt to bring some of these guys in. I think there's going to be some players we're going to see leaving soon. I think there's some players they would like to have out of here on the defensive side. And there's really nobody besides Watherspoon who's really stepped up into that role of saying, yes, this is our next call-up. So... 
there's definitely a huge opportunity there. If I was a forward coming out of the NCAA, I might not want to join the Flames because I might think, wow, there's a deep depth chart there, and I might get lost in it, especially if I'm a centerman. Mm-hmm. But as a defenseman, yeah, I think there, there's very few markets that would be better to, to join and fewer development systems too. We've shown the Flames are great at developing kids. Why not step right into that? Yeah, and with the Flames only having really Waterspoon, Kulak, Culkin, and Sealoff as legit AHL prospects next year, there's going to be, well, like, we need a six, seven, eight, nine defenseman down there. And realistically, Smeed and England and Diaz are not exceptional defensemen in the NHL. So you could replace them easily and if you come in and play you should be able to steal one of those spots for sure well, let's look at the next two guys you briefly uh, mentioned them but the next guy on your list was casey nelson who plays for the minnesota state university uh he's got 16 he's got 21 points this year 16 assists five goals he's also 22 six foot two and again on the small side 183 pounds um he plays on that team with his brother i think his brother josh is on that team as well Mm -hmm. uh yeah his brother's a defenseman too which is kind of interesting yeah what what uh what makes nelson stand out among these four uh he's basically just a bigger guy he's six foot two and like he is a little undersized weight wise but you can get him to hit the training room and get him to fill out a bit anytime that you're getting a ncaa defenseman who's near a point per game usually that means they have some pretty solid offensive skill and uh, he might be weak on the defensive side. I haven't seen a lot of him play. Actually, I haven't seen a lot of any of these guys play. So it's more trying to find somebody that has some skill, and if you can work with them to fill the holes in their game, maybe you might get a guy that can play in the NHL. And the last guy on your list, also from Minnesota State University, um, is Zach Palmquist. He's 24, so he's the oldest of this group. An American, he's six foot, so smaller than everyone else, and 174 pounds. He's got 19 points, 13 assists, and six goals this year. He's the most likely of the three NCAA players to graduate this year and like sign with an NHL team. The other two guys are 22, and they have another year left of eligibility. So they might go back if they don't get a good offer. Well, and that's interesting too. I mean, that's something that we've seen the Flames deal with over the last couple of years with guys like Agostino and Bryce Van Vabrant and even Johnny Goudreau of bringing these guys in before they've graduated. And I would imagine the Flames have almost created some sort of a program to help these guys make sure they're getting their studies done and graduating. We all know that, you know, Johnny Goudreau's mother said he can't, sign the NHL deal if he's not going to continue his schooling. And when we talked to some of these guys, you and I, in the summer, um, we, you know, they were all going back to school and still doing their studies. So that might be attractive, too, to look at a team like Calgary and say, wow, these guys know how to deal with college athletes turned pro. Yeah, and Calgary has pretty much the most experience of any of the NHL teams with the NCAA. And I think we can probably credit Jay Feaster for that. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, for sure. And I think he's sometimes really Jay Feaster in... doesn't get credit for where it's due with his time in the Flames. So I always like to yeah. point out things they did well here. Yeah, he really embraced going after guys in the NCAA. Like, I remember prior to Feaster, like, the Flames would pretty much sign nobody out of that league. So... Yeah, it's good. And like we've seen a guy like Josh Juris come in and be a good NHL player. He scored his 10th goal tonight and has been excellent for the Flames. Yeah, I mean, you know, Johnny Goudreau comes from college. Even so, I mean, there's hits and misses, let's be honest. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, we look at a guy like Bryce Van Brabrandt, who I would say is probably a miss. I don't know how you feel about that one. Yeah. Uh, y- uh, AHL depth, he might figure it out. Who knows? Uh, you give him a couple of years. We've seen guys in the past like Brady Lamb get signed, and he didn't turn out. Oh, well. 
it happens, and you gotta just keep throwing the darts at the board and hoping that some of them turn out. For sure, and you know, I think if you look at our our record there, we have many more turnout that don't. So I think that going after some of these guys would probably be a good idea. Um, has there been any rumors of other teams that are going after these guys? Do we know what competition we have for some of these four? Uh, usually they don't discuss things like that until towards the end of the NCAA season. Like I know uh, when DeKaiser, uh, who signed with Detroit, he uh, there wasn't really any rumors until March-ish of that year yeah. so we'll see yeah the khl rumors sometimes leak early yeah um, so the, the one khl d man we might have some rumors early i know when the flames signed um oh what was his name the russian guy the russian center we brought over a couple of years ago that's the guy i tried to forget his name right after he left um that was rumored for a couple months i think about this time of year they started talking about the flames talking to him yeah so we'll see. I'm hoping that the Flames might be able to pick some guys out of the KHL, especially with how unstable that league is at the moment. And with having a guy already in the organization in Russian Rafikov, hopefully like uh, the Flames will be giving him an opportunity to come over and play. So hopefully he can help entice some other guys to come over as well. Well, and, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, earning a spot on the NHL team. And I think even if you look at the AHL roster, there are players there, defensemen there, that I think are really going to have to prove themselves next year if they want to stick around. I'm thinking specifically of Sina Akalazzi, uh John Ramage, and I'd say even Mark Kandari at this point. Like those are guys that... I think if you bring any one of these young guys in or any, you know, uh, draft picks that the Flames might turn pro on the blue line, those are going to be the guys almost like your Devin Setaguchi this year, we said at the beginning of the year of this is the player you have to beat to be on the roster. Mm -hmm. And I think the Flames will see some turnover on the blue line in Adirondack. Uh, the guys that you mentioned and maybe even a few of the veteran players like Stevenson and Yonkman might not be back. We'll have to see, but there should be spots available if you can take them and even on the AHL team and hopefully the Flames can just add some more people and more talent to the Flames blue line because that has been Adirondacks weakness this year has been their lack of talent on defense it's been a weakness throughout the whole organization yeah so at the nhl the echl and the ahl level true and the only way that you can improve it is by getting more guys in there that have some talent and giving them an opportunity uh, you might not get anybody that actually works out you might who knows but you have to get more guys in there to see and that's what we did on the forward ranks right is we just brought in a lot of guys and now we're seeing who sticks and i think there's some real surprises there and i think we're going to see some interesting personnel moves as well made because of it yeah exactly like the flames had a decently deep team prior to getting guys like augustino hanowski van brabrant and a whole bunch of other guys so you know, it, and the best ones were rising to the top. And, and you know, we, we talked about this last night on uh, Agree or Disagree, the podcast, but I said even a guy like Max Reinhardt, who going into this season, I thought was probably the number two, maybe number three center on the depth chart, seems to have fallen. I mean, he hasn't even been called up yet. And a lot of guys, <laughs> was he called up this season? Yeah, he played a few games in November. Oh, okay. Um, so he got sent sent back down right away, but you know I think a guy like that has probably fallen down the depth chart, and we may see him move to another team because there's value there. Mm -hmm. And you got teams like the Islanders and the Sabers who would probably want to acquire him just because they have his brother on the team. And we'd be happy to take a defenseman back. Exactly, and both of those teams are extremely flush with defensemen. So, you know, if the Flames could trade Reinhardt for a guy like Chad Rudewell or, 
any of the Islanders defensemen. They have so many talented ones. So, you know, there's options available. And we'll talk more about some of those options as we get closer to March 2nd as well. Exactly. We got time. So wrapping up this week, uh, last week we did our usual prediction um, at the end of the show. We had only one game to predict, and both of us failed miserably. You thought we were yeah. going to get a win in Anaheim, and I thought we'd walk away with at least one point. So we both got snubbed there. And that's why I don't bet on anything. <laughs> so It was... I, I think that we, at least me, I knew in my heart that we probably wouldn't win. But with the way that Ordeo was playing, it was hard to bet against the Flames. Well, you would figure that they're due. Like, come on. <laughs> and coming on a four-game winning streak, everything's going right. The hot goalie. Yeah, it's just that building. Yeah. Oh, well. Don't buy a Honda, anyone. (laughs) You know, uh, every team moves, and maybe by the time they move to a new building in, say, 15, 20 years, we'll finally start winning there again. Yep. (laughs) We got six six points, three games in the table until we talk next on February 3rd. Um, We just saw the Flames get a 4-1 to win over Buffalo tonight, so we won't count that one. But we've got Minnesota coming up on Thursday. That's alumni night featuring Gary Roberts at the Cell Dome. Saturday night, the Flames take on our rivals from the from up north, from the north in the Oilers. And then on Monday, we have the Winnipeg Jets coming to town. So six games on the table. Uh, only one of those teams above us in the standings. How do you think we're going to do? I'm going to say they're going to sweep the week and get six points. I think we're going to get all six. Yeah, why not? They need to start separating themselves from the rest of the pack and establish themselves firmly in the playoffs. So best way to do that is to beat up on everybody. I think we're going to beat the wild. We better beat the Oilers. I think we'll probably not walk away with two points against Winnipeg. Well, Um, I don't, I don't know if it'll be a loss, but I don't know. We're going to walk away with two points. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Winnipeg, their defense has been the catalyst of their team, so hopefully the Flames can shut them down and get a little offense from our own guys. If you can only watch one game this week, I think the Winnipeg game is going to be the most interesting one to watch. Yeah, well, anytime you're facing teams that are below you in the standings, it's usually a boring game. Sort of like the one tonight. So I'll be at the Dome on Saturday for the Battle of Alberta. Even though the Oilers suck right now, that's always a lot of fun to go watch. Yeah, I'm only going to be uh, at the Thursday game, believe it or not. i uh, been busy tonight and on uh, Saturday, so I won't be there for those two. But you'll be there for Alumni Night featuring Gary yes. Roberts on the 29th. And that night, too, for anyone that's a Flame season ticket holder, Gary Bettman is in town. Uh, he'll be at the Boyce Theater before the game on Thursday, answering questions and giving a state of the NHL address. So if you're a season ticket holder, check your email. Uh, your season ticket holder account manager has sent you something there. And we hope Matt and I will both be there on uh, for that on Thursday for the Gary Bettman talk. So hopefully we'll see some Fireside Chat fans. If you see us there, come by and say hi. Yep. Well, Matt, let's see how we do. We got six points on the table, and uh, I'm I'm hoping you're right. I'm hoping we're going to plow through all three teams, but I have a strong feeling that Winnipeg's going to end up standing our way of that. Yeah. So are you going to plug our appearance last night? That's a good point. Yeah. Last night we were on uh, Agree or Disagree, the podcast. It's uh, not really a sports podcast, though once in a while they throw some sports stuff in there. We were on the podcast before. We came and talked to them right after training camp at the beginning of the season for a bit of a Flames preview. And we were on last night giving a recap of the season so far, which was actually a lot of fun to do. It's always fun to think back on such a great season. So if you're interested in that, uh, best way to find them is probably to go on Twitter at A or D the podcast or check out our Twitter at Fireside Podcast. And we have a link there to our appearance as well. We'll also put it up on Facebook. Um, so check out our social media or go right to A or D the po- at A or D the podcast on Twitter. Google them. You'll probably find them. Um, but yeah, both Matt and I were on there and we were recapping the flames for the season. Yeah, it was nice to talk to Kevin again. And I'm hoping that we'll be on for a season wrap-up, and it'll be late June, and we'll be sitting around in shorts when we're doing that one. 
Yeah. Should we get the Stanley Cup, you know, to be our co-host? I said to Kevin last night, I said, if we're doing it in June, we'll, maybe we'll be lucky enough to be live from the Stanley Cup parade. Yeah. We can have our okay, own Okay, back to reality. Come on. <laughs> you got a dream, right? Oh, yeah. We'll see. Well, who knows if we'll even get there. We just got to get in the playoffs first, and then we can start talking about a parade. Yeah, and then Johnny Gaudreau will be unleashed on the league. Exactly. So, yeah, if you want more Flames news, check out that podcast. And I think that's probably it for us uh, for the week. Anything else you want to chat about, Matt? No, I'm good. Uh, It was nice to see the Flames beat the Sabres, and hopefully they can keep rolling on through the homestand. Have a good week, everybody, and we'll talk to you again in early February. Yeah, take care, everybody. Bye. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.